Warning, the Savage Nation contains adult language, adult content, psychological nudity. Listener discretion is advised. And now, America's most exciting radio talk show, The Savage Nation. Talk radio for the thinking person, home of borders, language, culture. And here he is, Michael Savage. Say your prayers, it's a one. Don't forget my son to include everyone. I tuck you in, all within. Keep you free from sin till the Sandman he comes. Ooh, the Sandman is going to come. So, who is your inner Sandman? Is it Rubio? Rubio could be no one's in a Sandman except uh, Sheldon Adelson, and it tells you about, a lot about Sheldon Adelson that Rubio would be his inner Sandman. Cruz looks like I'm sorry again. I know you got to go through the whole litany. Cruz would make a wonderful guy. Don't attack him. He knows the Bible. He knows the Holy Ghost, and he knows the Constitution. Wonderful guy. The problem is he looks like a vampire. Can't win. End the story. The shady eyes. Don't know what it. Don't know why. I, I, I saw this article over the weekend. Ted Cruz thinks Duck Dynasty actor would make great UN ambassador. Yeah, just what we need in the UN. A guy with a headband and a beard that looks like like he's out of a vampire movie himself. He's coming to, like, slaughter your whole family after taping your mouth shut. Sure, send him to the UN, Ted. That's, that's a good idea. I'm still examining the Scalia death. I haven't dropped it from my website. What, just because you dropped it means I forgot about it? I haven't, so people are still asking about that. Here are some of the questions. I don't know. I don't want to do this. I got spring fever today. I know in the East Coast it's not spring yet, but the allergies are so bad here. And I finally understand what spring fever is. It's basically allergies. Where you walk around in a fog, you don't even want to work. So I wake up and I see Jeb Bush is out. He kind of you feel bad for him after he spent he burned through 130 million dollars. 130 million dollars. You know, and I looked into where the money went. We'll have that for you on the show. Because I told you all these guys stay in it as long as they can. They know they can't win. But the money that is being spent on, on cronies and friends and wives and cousins and idiot moron relatives they didn't talk to who are now becoming their consultants who travel with them in an entourage like Elvis Presley, that's where they stay in it. Between the advertising and going to clubs and valets and pizzas and people and Vegas and branding and consultants and pizza, everyone stays in it for that reason. If they steal a dollar, they go to jail, but they don't. They hire the idiot cousin that couldn't get a job. <clears throat> so what's in the news? Pope calls for worldwide ban of death penalty. Again? Does this guy know? Does he know how to shut his mouth? When did he stop being a Wait, when did he start being a pope? That's the real question. Did he ever? Was he ever a pope? I mean, who was this guy? He was a bouncer in Argentina. They found him. They made him. Whatever. Leave me alone with this. The red and the black. Read that French novel from the early, what was it, 1820, 1840? The Red and the Black, where an ambitious young French, young man, a young, ambitious man in France realizes that the society is very restricted. And the only routes to becoming successful in France at that time was through the Red or the Black. And he traces two lives, the Red and the Black. The Red is the army and the Black is the priesthood. Political! The church was a political organization, like it is today. Pope calls for worldwide ban of death penalty. Who is this guy? The Obama administration wants to make sure non-citizens vote in the upcoming election. That's a big story. Loretta Lynch should be impeached already. Here is the top law enforcement official in America, and she's saying she wants to make sure that illegal aliens can vote. Attorney General Loretta Lynch, the Republican should impeach her for violating the terms of her job. Right. Most Democrats say socialism has positive impact on society. What do they know? Democrats appear to be embracing socialism more and more. Blah, blah, blah. A six to ten majority of Democrats say socialism has a positive impact on society. What do they know, idiots? What do they know? Socialism kills. I have a story on that. Out of Israel, from the J-Post. Not feeling the burn. Israeli snub Sanders' outreach attempt. Why? Why do they hate Bernie Sanders? He's Jewish. Well, no, he's not Jewish. He said he's not a practicing Jew. I don't know. He's an unpracticing Jew? I don't know what that means. I'm not a practicing Jew. Bernie Sanders says I'm not a practicing Jew. What does that mean? So he's not. So he's an unpracticing Jew or an unpracticed Jew? Okay, he's an unpracticed Jew. 
That'd be like a Catholic saying, I'm not a practicing Catholic. Well, what are you practicing instead? Witchcraft? What are you practicing, Bernie? You're practicing hatred 101. But the Israelis said the reason they don't like him is because, I'm quoting now, socialism increases racism and hate as it places every sector's hand in the other's pocket and everyone's hand into his friend's pocket, which creates animosity between different groups in society. That says it well. It really does. But, you know, I have to think about that. About it. Not all socialists are bad. Inherently, they're just, let's say, they've lost in life. They're miserable. They hate everyone around them, anyone who has a nicer car. As it said, a nicer car, a nicer suit, a nicer pair of shoes, a nicer wife, a nicer girlfriend. That's the natural home for a socialist. It's a place for people filled with hate and resentment. The, those on Social Security checks in Cafe Trieste in San Francisco, for example. Guys who've never worked a day in their life. They collect uh, uh, crazy checks, and then they hate the world. Yeah, this one blocked them from becoming a famous film writer. That one blocked them from becoming a novelist. But the fact of the matter is I'm thinking about it. You know, I started in radio in 1994, and I look back, and I wonder what my life would have been had I not had the motivation to send out a demo tape to 425 stations and be invited by three or four to... Uh, be on their stations and the rest is history I mean I went from local to national and now very successful and very happily successful after all these years but if I look back and I say well what if I had not sent out that demo tape and what if I like today was still living in that rental house from 1994 driving an old Volvo four on the floor I think an old four-cylinder Volvo right I'd be wearing the same clothing ponytail would be down to my ankles. Uh, I would have so many medical conditions from sitting around with anger that my itis would have itis on it. I, every itis I have would have an itis on it. I have so many itises being cared for for free through socialism. See, they invent illnesses, a lot of people who have free medical care. If you have nothing to do all day, think about it. If you have nothing to do all day except go to the doctor and it's free, and people don't like you. Your, mo your wife doesn't like you. Your mother doesn't like you. No one likes you. Children don't talk to you. The only one who listens to you is the doctor. So if you can get a nice young doctor to listen to you, complain for seven minutes, let's say, where the time you're allowed in Kaiser Hospital or somewhere, uh, and ask, so what's wrong? What's hurting? What hurts you, Mr. And you tell them. And then they go to another doctor, a neurologist, a proctologist, a psychologist, uh, an ologist I never heard of. They, they do all day long. They book them. It's like their booking schedule. Most of you have a calendar. Will you look at my calendar? What you actually have to do? They book it. They look at the calendar to see what doctors are going to go to that week. That's socialism 101 when it's free. You got to make them copay. So I'm thinking now, if I had not gotten into radio, I might have been a Bernie Sanders supporter. Now I think about it, like the, half the people in Marin County, nasty nasty old people running around. They'll run you over if they could on the road here. Gray hair, mean. These are the type who went to Cuba to co collect sugar cane. So, you know, you can understand how people wind up in those places. But you want to talk about the inner Sandman. I was going to talk about that for a minute because that's the opening song, the inner Sandman. It's called Sandman or inner Sandman, the, uh, the Motley crew. Huh? Is Sandman or inner Sandman? Is anyone listening to the show? Because the phone number is 855-407-282. Why do you still support Bernie Sanders when he's finished? He didn't have a chance to begin with. He was used by the Democrat Party to make her look more centrist. Who told you that? Me. What's the name of the song, Robert? We don't know. Still checking. But at the end of the show, I'll let you know the name of the show. Enter Sandman. Enter Sandman or Inner Sandman? Oh, Enter Sandman by Metallica. I'm asking you who your Sandman is in this election. Many think that Trump is their Sandman. Many think that uh, Cruz is their Sandman. I don't think too many people think that uh, uh, Dr. Carson is their Sandman. But is Trump your Sandman? Is Trump your inner Sandman? Because he's going to disappoint you. You know he's going to disappoint you because all politicians have to. No politician can give you 100% of what you're dreaming for, but you dream that they can. So even though many of you know that Trump is quite liberal on social issues, which he is, why do you still support him? Is there is I think that's a critical question. He had a gonzo victory over the weekend. Cruz has basically got his nose broken. 
Cruz was less broke, was left busted in the street. I mean, all the predictions, he waved the snakes, he waved the Bibles, went down there, he pandered to the evangelicals, he used every dirty trick known to politics. He tr used every dirty trick known to politics, Cruz, the vampire, and he got trashed. I wonder where his supporters are today. They must have had a really bad Sunday, that's all I can say. So it must have been a, like a funeral for the Cruzites out there. Okay, so Trump won. It looks like his, all of a sudden all the people who hated him, hated him, put him down. All of a sudden, you know, he could win. Oh, that guy Trump could win. I, oh, yeah, I've known it all along. Oh, yeah, look at that. He, he's one of those winners. Well, there's no reason not to get behind him now, Bernie. See, they're all lining up now. They're all making calls. They want to be a consultant, an advisor, an ambassador to India. All of a sudden, because they know he could win, all of a sudden he's not so bad anymore. Now, I supported him from the beginning for a number of reasons. Number one is because I think he can beat Hillary. That's the number one reason. Do you know that? And you don't understand why that's important. Even if he is somewhat liberal on some issues, as I've told you, stop being a purist. Purists can't win. They win in academic discussions. Purists win on radio. Purists win in uh, closed sessions with college students. Purists win when they have their own little conventions. That's where purists thrive. But on the big stage, known as the national election, purists never win. Do you know that? You know that. Okay, you don't know that. Well, I'll give you a little lesson on that. So the point is, a couple of weeks ago, I gave a very brilliant monologue on blood in the water, purists versus pragmatists. And I do know that it's it, 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 it kind of it hit home. And I said then, the frenzy is based upon the fact that Donald Trump is the new gladiator. He's the knight in shining armor that most American women have been waiting for forever. He's the man on the white horse that most American men have been waiting for. And I wrote then, listen to this, this was 128.16. What the media senses right now is that by Fox turning on Trump, they have put a chink in his armor, so to speak, and that's caused a little bit of blood to come out of Trump, and the sharks are going crazy. They smell blood in the water. They want that wound opened up even further. They want to see that knight in shining armor on the ground bleeding to death, vanquished at last by the Democrat socialist Islamist media complex. And then I said the Democrats are laughing because they see the entire Republican Party split in two, with the purists attacking the pragmatists and the pragmatists mocking the purists. And I wrote, however, both sides happen to be right. Of course we would all like a purist candidate. However, most every election in the past has been lost on the Republican side by purist candidates who did not appeal to the masses. Or people just set out the election if the candidates are not pure enough for them. I understand that, given the, what Boehner and McConnell and Ryan have done and are doing to the very voters who put them in power to advance the conservative agenda against the extremist President Obama, who should still be impeached before he destroys what's left of the country, or against the extremist liar, extremist liar Hillary Clinton, or uh, as such. <clears throat> I, I wrote all of that, and I, I still agree with it. But the point of this discussion is, is a little different than what you may think. I'm asking you, is Trump your inner Sandman, even though you know that he's not a purist? We know he's going to waffle on issues. Why do you still support him is the, is the, main, is the main point. See, this is what I want to know. Why do you still support him, even though you know, listening to him here and there and this and that, you've come to say, well, you know, he's really not right on this issue. I'm not, I don't trust him on that issue, but I still am going to vote for him. Why? Why are you going to vote for him? What is the zeitgeist of Donald Trump that makes you want to vote for him, even though he doesn't help you, let's say, check off every box on the so-called conservative uh, checklist of wish, uh, wish list, so to speak? Why? I mean, I know why I picked them from the beginning. I told you that right from the get-go, and I'll tell it to you again. Now, if you want to join the conversation, you can grab a line at 855-400-SAVAGE, 855-400-7282. I'll be back. Mr. Sandman. We are talking about the Sandman phenomenon. Now, Obama, who was an unknown, 
came across as a Sandman who would answer everyone's wishes. Remember that? In fact, I, when I first heard him, when he was saying he's going to shrink government, he's going to make it honest, he was saying we're going to make it as uh, transparent as you can imagine, we're going to kick the bums out. He was a liar. The man has turned out to be an authoritarian demagogue of the lowest order, and now he's still lying through his teeth. I want you to listen to clip 19 of the last Sandman we got. Barack Hussein Obama in clip 19. We have been very stringent and very tight, and our numbers all check out when it comes to the costs and the benefits uh, that we apply to these tests. Even on some of the big regulations you hear about that you don't like, they're not, pa they're not issued unless we th the benefits substantially uh, outweigh the costs. Uh, uh, um, and we, can, we uh, have the numbers to prove it. So uh, for those of you who think that... Uh, I'm just a big government crazy liberal. <laughs> you know, we're, we're actually, we, we've crunched some numbers around here. Uh, we take it very seriously. Can you crunch the numbers on Michelle's 72 personal assistants, Mr. Obama? How do those numbers work out? You said that unless the benefits substantially outweigh the cost. Do the benefits to your wife outweigh the cost to the taxpayer? And by the way, can you please crunch the numbers on all the golfing vacations that you've taken, you and your family? Do the benefits outweigh the costs, Mr. Obama? Let's just start with you and your family. How about the cost of your mother-in-law living in the White House? Who pays for that? Do the benefits outweigh the costs, Mr. Obama? So you're still lying right to this day. So you say, who's the next Sandman? That's the question. Obama lied. They all do. That's why they're called politicians. The word politician inherently means someone who's going to deceive the public. Deceive the public. That's what it means. You run for office, you have to appeal to the widest possible audience that you can and then deliver as little as you promised without getting thrown into, get, into jail. That, that's the nature of a politician, which is why I'm not in politics. You think with my charisma I couldn't have run for office? You must be joking. What, are you joking? I couldn't have run for office? I'll be back. Join the Savage Nation. Call now, 855-400-SAVAGE. 855-400-7282. Savage. Is rock and roll of talk radio, the Savage Nation. <laughs> it really is in its own way. I looked back watching that show Vinyl on HBO. It, was, it wasn't bad last night. It got better. Billions got worse. You know, one gets better, one gets worse. These Sunday night shows, at least I got Vinyl to watch before Billions. So I got two hours to kill on Sunday night without a total and absolute Welsh schmerz meltdown on a Sunday night, which is always the worst night of the week. The worst night of the week. Even as a kid, those Sunday nights were a disaster for me. Ed Sullivan, suicide. When I saw Ed Sullivan, the Ed Sullivan show coming on on Sunday nights, I got such a depression, I didn't even know what it was. A sadness, a horrible feeling. Because I had to go to school the next day with a teacher who had a toilet water on her that gave me a migraine. I didn't know to this day what it was, what I hated about elementary school. It was her toilet water. And that she, I, I don't mean to be a little, you know, it's a family show. But she'd expose herself to the children. I, I maybe by accident. I don't know. But the whole combination package got me sick. To this day, I am. I remember that teacher. I get migraines from it. Thinking about it. So we're talking about this election. And okay, so Saturday night was the big thing, the big victory. I didn't. I didn't even know what happened. I didn't watch it. The, the returns. I went somewhere. I don't know where. It's nowhere important. It's not important. Last night I went to a Latin dance. I loved it because you can escape for an hour or two to the great music of... Uh, I grew up in that music in New York. It's unbelievable. This guy is a local group, Mazacote. It's unbelievable. You watch the musicians play. I know I'm getting uh, drifting off from what you want to hear about, but it's a whole thing. Your life is a whole thing. It's not two-dimensional, folks. It's many-dimensional, or else you're just a Democrat or, or a Republican, which I am not. I never have been. So I'm saying, okay, so who's your Sandman? For some it's Cruz, for some it's this one, for some it's Trump. Uh, Obama, we saw what kind of Sandman. This guy was this liar. He's still getting away with it. So the next one's going to disappoint you. I mean, Hitler was Germany's Sandman. They were in a depression. They lost the war. They were humiliated. He came up with a scapegoat. The Jews did it to them. And look where he went. Now we learn today Hitler had a deformed penis as well as just one testicle, historians claim. If I were making this up, 
you'd think I'm a clown. It, it was a story today on the Drudge Report. I couldn't believe my eyes. I said, what? I heard about the, you know, the one thing. I didn't know about the other part. Hitler had a tiny deformed you-know-what, as well as just one you-know-what, historians claim. Hitler suffered from a condition called hypospadias. Hypospadias? Sounds like a Greek dish. Hypospadias? It sounds like spanakopita. Hypo, okay, hypo, yeah, spadias, which left them with an abnormally small manhood, according to historians Jonathan Mayo and Emma Craigie. And that's what made him rage and conquer other countries. Oh, God, that's horrible. I thought it was the hypoglycemia where he would eat these these rich pastries because he was a vegetarian and a teetotaler. He didn't drink alcohol. And he was a veggie. He didn't like to kill animals, only people. He liked to torture people to death and watch movies about that. But he would get sick if he watched an animal being hunted. But I thought it was the hypoglycemic attacks that accounted for his madness. Low, low blood sugar. But the notorious playground rhyme about his uh, single you-know-what uh, seems to have only told half the story. Is that a new book claims the leader of the Third Reich had a micro penis. Now, why am I telling you this? One, because you're interested in it. I saw it this morning, and it's from a newspaper in England called a Telegram. Maybe the guy's just selling a book. How would you know a thing like that? Oh, they've discovered medical records which confirm the Fuhrer's embarrassing deformity. I don't want to read all the details. I'll, I'll leave that to you. This discovery that Hitler had only one and a small one may explain why Hitler was allegedly afraid of being seen naked and the cause of his famed fits of rage. It also is likely to add to fuel to the debate on Hitler's sex life or lack thereof, which is fiercely contested by historians. In his biography of Hitler, the British historian Ian Kershaw said the Austrian-born Nazi was repelled by sexual activity of any kind as he feared catching an infection. He only liked to invade and murder. That's all. Sex he didn't like. That goes back to the war, like the Vietnam War, where they put flowers in the gun and said, make love, not war. They weren't wrong in a way. They should put, try to do that with the Taliban. Put a, put a flower in their ba a rifle barrel, girls. All you aging hippies over in county, go over there to Iraq and uh, Syria. See if you can put a flower in the Taliban's gun barrel. See if you'll get away with it. But I'm getting distracted here by this story because it, it, it connects to my main theme. My main theme is that you're looking for a Sandman. Everyone wants a Sandman to save the country, right? That's what we're all here. Now, we know Hitler is... I'm sorry. Almost, I'm sorry, Hitler, I'm, we know Hillary's not the sand woman. We know that. We know what to get from her. She's a complete liar. Useless liar from a thug machine. Worthless. So we know she offers nothing. No hope, no change, nothing. Not even the hope of a change. Zero. At least Bernie Sanders, to his socialist credit, offered something. Albeit a flawed concept of socialism, but he offered something to people who are desperate for the system to be broken over their knee. Let's be clear. Let's be clear. There are a lot of people out there who are, for one reason or another, dissatisfied, whether they're poor or they're on bad health or they're a, a misguided, hateful immigrant who shouldn't have come here to begin with. Uh, they, they think Sanders is going to help them. He wouldn't help anybody, pit everyone against everyone. That's what they do, socialists. But anyway, he offered something. He was the Sandman and still is the Sandman, Bernie. Actually, Sanders, Bernie Sandman. We're going to call him Bernie Sandman from now on. But on our side, we got a couple of Sandmen. We got, actually, some look like bagmen to me. We got Ted Cruz. We got Marco Rubio, who looks like a bagman for Las Vegas. And Donald Trump was beholden to no one. Now, you see, I talk to people who are worth a lot of money, and they say at least he's not part of the system, and he's not beholden to anyone. I think that's almost the crux of the whole matter. Now, his, his beautiful family doesn't hurt him, by the way, but they weren't seen in the beginning. So you can't say that's the big reason for a success. His unadulterated ability to stand up to bullies by being a bigger bully makes him appealing to us because we live in such a vicious world that we need someone to bully the vermin on the planet into submission in plain English. It's like getting a verbal, mar a verbal cage fighter running for the presidency. Write it down before it's stolen, before it leaves my mouth. Trump is like a verbal cage fighter, and we don't care how crude he is. We don't care how rude he is. We just want him to take the enemy and make him bleed on the canvas. We'd like to see them. We'd like to see our enemies smashed to death and bleeding on the canvas, having to be dragged out by an ambulance by a, on a stretcher. 
And we know he's the one who's liable to do it, no one else. It's plain English. We all want a strong leader after this eight years of this wimpy lie who stabbed us in the back. You know, talk loudly and carry a limp stick, Barack Obama. Tough with everyone in America and a wimp on the world stage. Because he knows he can control us with the FBI, the CIA, and the NSA. We're all afraid of him. Because he uses these corrupt governmental agencies to intimidate us in plain English. Okay, so... As I stand before you, again, I come back to my primary Monday theme today. Who is your Sandman and why? And we go back again to Donald Trump. He's the Sandman for a lot of people, for the reasons I explain. Now, many of you distrust him. I get that. You distrust him for your reasons, and I understand that. Whether I do or I don't is irrelevant to you. You're skeptical, and you're naturally skeptical of anyone in politics, which you should be. And that's absolutely true. However... Remember how he came to power and on what theme? Build a wall with Mexico, do you remember? And right after Kate Steinle's vicious murder at the hands of a Mexican illegal alien in San Francisco, it sure struck home. It was right after he announced that issue of build the wall, make the Mexicans pay for it. It was like someone saying it after Obama destroyed our borders and told the Border Patrol to stand down. Someone's going to stand up for America's borders? Hey, that's a big one. Because how many years have I been preaching the, the, uh, the mantra of borders, language, culture? Forever. Borders, language, culture. See, with borders, you get language and you get your culture back, by the way. Without borders, you have no language and you have no culture. It, it, it seeps out of your nation, just as your, your protoplasm will leak out of your cell if you destroy the cell membrane. Or in the case of a plant, the cell wall. The protoplasm leaks out of the cell if you cut the, the, the membrane or the cell wall. Same with the border. You cut the border, the culture seeps out. And in this case, diseases and terrible foreign influences seep in. Because not all immigrants are the same. That's number one. Not all cultures come here to add anything. We all know that. Number two. And there's a lot of hurting people in America, number three, who don't want the competition. Now, having said that, please don't put me in the category of Mr. Xenophobe because I'm the last person on earth. And I'm going to prove it to you. I challenge any other talk show host in this con in this nation, left or right, any one of these lily white talk show hosts, liberal or conservative, to tell me that they actually go down in the streets with the average person. They don't. I dare any lily white talk show host, NPR or anywhere else, to tell me that they go to a dance as I did last night with 98% black and Latino men, which I did. Why? I didn't do it to prove anything. I went for the music. Because I found something out a long time ago, even when I was a young man. Music is a universal medicine. And it, I'm talking about music. I'm not talking about violence expressed in lyrics and, and, and uh, with instruments. I'm talking about beautiful music, which tends to glorify romance and it glorifies woman. All that music is about romance and women. That's all it's about. Do you know that? It's always my heart. Me corazón, uh, son, son, son. My heart, my heart, my heart. All of the music is beautiful, but it lifts you up and carries you away. And then to watch people dance, and you see the movement of the feet and the swaying of the bodies and the, the way the skeletons move underneath the flesh, and you realize it's spirit animating body. That's a beautiful thing, and I enjoyed it last night. And it's a funny thing, you know, if you're in a crowded dance hall, if I rub against a black guy or a Hispanic guy, it's always like, well, excuse me, both sides. I'm not a threatening-looking person, but I'm a human being. It's always, oh, excuse me. I mean, that's what I'm saying. It was polite. So what I'm saying to you are several things at once. Xenopho xenophobia comes from not understanding people because you're never around them. You don't even know who they are. You have no idea. Oh, I don't like this one. I don't like that one. It runs in all races, by the way, in all different directions. You actually have to be around other human beings to understand that they're all human beings, good, bad, and, ind and ugly, you know, and indifferent. So having said that, we'll come back to who's the Sandman. Who's your Sandman? And since we're coming up against the hard break, I, I wrote something beautiful for you after the... I don't know whether I wrote it before it. I got a little chuckle to myself. I was coming out of the dance club last night, and it was already dusk over in Sausalito, California. And, you know, I got so many things I want to say at once all of a sudden. There's an area in uh, in the Bay Area that I go to. Now, I started my radio career by sending out a dummy, uh, a demo tape that I recorded 
on pure spec. No one said do it. No one said, hey, kid, make a demo tape. 1993, I go to a little place called Command Productions in Sausalito, California, in an old uh, shipyard, the old Kaiser shipyards, and it was a sound studio. And I made a demo tape in that studio and sent it out to 400 or so radio station program directors <laughs> with a list that I purchased from a man that I had met on one of my book tours who gave me the list. And as I say, that little vortex has so much going on for me, it's astounding. There's a boat yard where I bought my first big boat. There's uh, a number of things. I don't remember all of the things, but there's a vortex in that area that's astonishing in that little area. So as I say, I, I was coming out early, 8 o'clock after. I go early. It starts at 5, and I have enough after an hour or two. It gets too loud for me and this and that. But I got so drawn into the music. The flautist was as good as Jose Fajardo, one of the greats. The timbales play, I, I, I said to him in Spanish during the break, I said, Tu es el rey de timbal, because he was. He was the king of timbales. It was unbelievable how good these guys were. You have to love the music to understand what I'm saying to you. When music is right, dance music, and not a beat is missed, and it's so compelling, then you you're transcended. You're lifted off your feet. Even if you're not dancing, you're lifted out of your body. So you have that for that moment without drugs. And so I go out. It's dusk. The stars are up in the sky. It was like one of those where everything is right again. And I wrote a poem called Everyone's a Star Behind Their Car, which I will read to you when I come back on The Savage Nation. <laughs> okay. I asked for it. I got it. I don't know if anyone in my audience likes this music. That's the problem. Play it up, though, anyway. What do I do? It's not the best of it, but I love this music. I not like what music in my funeral. Because of, uh, keep going. This is a little slow for me. I like a much faster pace. This is quick. Try dancing for this sometime, and you'll see if your itis can let you. Whatever itis you may have, see if it'll work on a dance floor, a crowded dance floor with black and Latino men and women. <laughs> Everyone's a star behind their car. Everyone's a star behind the bar. Everyone's a star from afar. For everyone slightly marred. The brigadier, the buccaneer, debonair or doctrinaire. The gondolier or the pamphleteer. Everyone's a star from afar. My friends, that's the poem, Everyone's a Star Behind Their Car. Because in a way, it ties into the Sandman theme of today's show. Everyone is cool from a distance. I mean, not everyone. I, I don't mean the women in Marin County and Volvos, uh, sobs who cut you off from the right lane with Bernie stickers. But aside from them, people get into a pompous state in their cars. We all do. We prop ourselves up. We put the seat on the highest position if we're short, the lowest position if we're tall. I mean, no one could see your body in a car. So all you see is like a head. And the car, the car becomes an extension of your body. That's why everyone buys a new car if they can afford it. And the car says something. That's what the ads are telling you. The ads are giving you an identity with the car. So if you buy like an Outback, whatever that is, I don't even know what it is, you're going on a trip to the mountains, to the Alpine Mountains with your girlfriend to, to climb in the Alpine. Because you, no one uses it for that. You go to a schlocky job somewhere and work in a cubicle. But the identity is, in his mind, he's driving in it to the cubicle. He thinks you think that he's on the way to pick up a, a, a supermodel to go climbing in the Alps, in his mind. But you're not. You see a Schmendrick in a, broken, in a, in a new little car. It's like the reverse is true, too. A guy in a Bentley turbo convertible, what do you see? Do you see a rich man? No, you see a, a man who's inadequate inside, who needs to show off. An old guy is trying to show you he's rich. That's another thing in the car. So cars show us stuff. We all do it. That's what I'm trying to get across. Everyone's a star behind the car. Everyone's a star behind the bar. Every bartender's a star. Am I right or wrong? So what does that have to do with politics? Figure it out. Join the Savage Nation. Call now. 855-400-SAVAGE. Savage. Warning, the Savage Nation contains adult language, adult content, psychological nudity. Listener discretion is advised. And now, America's most exciting radio talk show, The Savage Nation. Talk radio for the thinking person, home of borders, language, culture. And here he is, Michael Savage. 
The Latin Dance Hour with Senor Savage. I actually was playing the timbales during the break to this music. You have a set of timbales next to the desk. I used to play when I was younger. And uh, just hitting the bell, the old cowbell. It's amazing what kind of music you can get out of a cowbell. When you think of the music, how it evolved on a farm amongst, you know, cow hands, farm hands. They took the instruments they had, a cowbell, and they turned it into music. It's astounding. Anyway, the point is not about music. Or is it about music? Is there any music in this campaign? That's, that's another question. Because this whole campaign on the Republican side seems to be, I'm sorry to tell you, cruise baiting people. Holier than thou and more conservative than thou. Imposing a litmus test on all of them. On the Constitution, Christianity and Chastity, the three C's of this campaign. You know, the litmus test. Where do you stand on the Constitution? I am a better Christian than you. I am more chaste than you are. The three C's. I'm tired of it, frankly. And I can't wait for it to be over, to be honest with you. I hope Trump wins and that's it. Let him get the job done. But this is going to go on now, on and on and on and on and on, with the wicked witch of Warwick on the other side hanging in the wings. She should have been arrested a long time ago. If you ever did one-fiftieth of what she did with the emails, you'd be in such a dark holding cell, you wouldn't have, you would not, no, no amount of lawyers on earth could get you out. Just on the, on the fear that you'd flee the country. But that's because she has NPR in her pocket, because she has... You know, the networks, because she has all of these talking heads in her pocket. They're not asking her about it. Idiots like Anderson Cooper had the nerve to ask Bush last week before the big fall what his favorite music was. I feel bad, you know, I felt bad for Bush. This is not a good, I mean, I'm, let's put this, I didn't want him to win, okay? We knew he's a rhino. We knew he's washing establishment. He's not a bad guy, for God's sakes. He wasn't the devil. He wasn't an evil man. You know, and you see a guy like that, and you know he was not the strongest of the brothers, right? The bumbler was probably tougher than him. The bumbler, with the hesitancy, was probably a tougher kid than he was. This guy was like a nice guy, you know, and I know he's going to suffer for this. This is bad. The next thing is after a loss like this, I, I'm not saying I wish it doesn't happen, but usually a suffering, a humiliating loss like this, a disease follows not too long after. I'm sorry. I'm not saying it should happen. The opposite, I hope. But this kind of gut loss is a killer for a man at that age because it's over. The Bush dynasty's finished in a way, thank God. Not that they were all bad either, by the way. You could say that they were a corrupt establishment. Republicans it would all be true. But on the other hand, compared to the, what we got on the other side, you know, when you got the communists waiting on the other side and the Islamists waiting on the other side and the, the spies they put in everywhere and the deviants everywhere you turn. So, you know, so, okay. but now we got Trump versus who? Who's going to win? Who knows already? Probably Trump. It looks like Cruz, uh, it's over. He got a good beating in the cage fight the other night. And, I, and I've seen fights before. You know, if he couldn't win in South Carolina with the with Bible, with the snakes... With the whole holy roller thing, holding up the Constitution like he wrote it, holding up the cross like he was the disciple of Jesus himself, and pledging a chastity that no one could meet up, you know, live up to. And he still lost amongst evangelicals. And I figure the next step is even worse. And everyone now, oh, oh Trump could win. Everyone, all the doubting Thomas who threw mud at him, oh, now Trump, oh, he could win. You know, that guy could win and go all the way. Oh, yeah, yeah. They were all on his side all of a sudden. They put the finger up with the saliva on it, so which way the wind was blowing, now they're all for Trump. They're all lining up. Whether he'll remember me or not, I don't know. What do I want out of it? I don't need anything. At the end of the day, I think about it. I had a dream, actually. went to dinner with him, and we talked. I, know, I met him once at the club. Brought his wife over. This was like three years ago, four years ago. And I only go there once a year. I haven't been there this year once. I only go to Florida once a year. And every time I go to go to Mar-a-Lago once, and if he's there, I say hello to him. He says hello to me. So like two years ago, he came up with his wife. I said, Mr. Trump, how are you? He says, oh, Mel her name is Melania, right? The beautiful wife. I don't know her name. Is it Melania? Who? I can't pronounce it. Let me say Melania. I'm from the Bronx. Melania. I'm not from Hungary. Melania, whatever. Can we just cut it? Anyway, she's like Jackie Kennedy, incidentally. 
She is this generation's Jackie Kennedy. Wow, what a first lady she'd make with that foreign accent, like Zsa, Zsa Gabor on top of it all. America would so be in love with her. You can't believe it. I, I don't want to finish that sentence because you know what the rest of this one is, but there's no, no sentence that follows that one. The whole family would be a pleasure. We'd be proud again. I mean, this guy can make America great again just by winning with his family. The whole world would start saluting us because of his wife. Are you kidding? Everyone loves style. So the thing is, uh, yeah, now also, she came up and he said, oh, Michael Savage, he was with his lovely young son. He was a kid, dressed nice like in a suit, like an 8, 10-year-old in a suit and tie. I never had a suit. I had a suit, but I never wore it at that age. But where I came from, no one wore suits except uh, if you died, they put you in a box one. But the thing is, none of the men I knew ever wore a suit. A wedding or a funeral, that's the only time the men I knew wore suits. They were immigrants and they worked hard. But the thing is, he says, oh, Melanie, I want you to meet Michael Savage. He's one of the most important men in the media. I thought it was funny. But it, you see, even from the beginning, he was very complimentary. Maybe he knew he was going to run. And he needed friends in high places. But that's the only time I met him. So I have a dream. I met him and we talked. And I've thought about it. Many people say a joke. A friend called me up. I hadn't heard from him in a long time. He said, hey, so Mike, when Trump wins, you're going to be made Secretary of State. I laughed. <laughs> no, not likely. A, number one, no one's asking me. And B, I would not do well in a job like that. That's suit and tie, sitting around. I'd be a good negotiator with them. I Because I, I know most of them are corrupt. I'd look right through them. And I wouldn't let them get away with what they get away with. I don't want a job. Like, I don't want a job at all. I have a job. I'm retired, basically. This is my retirement job. I've been doing it for 21 years. <laughs> it's the hardest thing I ever did in my whole life, talk radio. There's nothing harder on earth. Nothing. Nothing can compare to this because you are... You're on a verbal tightrope for three straight hours. You say one wrong word, you are crucified and you're dead for life. Trust me, I was banned from Britain for something I didn't even say. I just know the stakes are so high. I guess I like it. I love the high wire act. I thrive on it. Ask the guys who work with me. Sometimes at five minutes before the hour that it starts, I can hardly move sometimes from exhaustion or allergies. Or maybe it's my body playing possum before I strike, you know, like a snake. All I can tell you is that I feel dead, and the minute that I hear that theme song, within a few seconds, it's like an adrenaline is running through my body. And ask him, it's true. And it's a matter of whether I can figure out how to hook you, get you interested, come up with a theme, a question, go into the thing, here we are, here we are already an hour and 12 minutes into it, playing some great music. But the whole election, as I say, seems to be about baiting people, holier than thou, more conservative than thou. You know, are you now or have you ever been a member of this party? Litmus test. Are, are you constitutionally correct? Are you a good enough Christian? Mr. Christian? And if you are, well, you're not as chaste as I am. I am a more chaste man than you are. Because I carry around the Bible and I can prove to you I'm better than you are. That's what it is. It's kind of boring uh, at the end of the day. I'd really rather hear about building a wall, crushing ISIS like a cockroach, what I really like to know is if Trump wins, is he going to go and arrest these Obama criminals, try them? That's what everyone's saying. Will he actually try Obama for the crimes he's committed against this nation? Will he let him get away with it? The answer is he won't touch him. But even Obama has modified his pitch. Do you know that the Trump's candidacy has already had an effect upon everything in this country? You don't know that. I do. That's why I'm paid to do a talk show. I see things you can't see until I explain it to you. Then you say, you know, he's right. Even Obama is now suddenly defensive on what a big government liberal maniac he is. I played that speech last hour. No, I'm not a big government liberal. We look at everything and evaluate costs and benefits. Yeah, right. Like your wife's personal assistance, your vacations, your abuse of power. Sure, you, you have value, right? But even he's suddenly uh, backpedaling. He sees the popularity of Sanders. He sees the popularity of Trump. And he suddenly sees that he is the odd man out and everyone's on to him. As they're saying, well, will he pay for this, for what he's done to this country, how he's spent us into oblivion, printing money, a $13 trillion debt the last I checked when he came to power, wasn't it $3 trillion? Now it's $13 trillion? Where'd the money come from? Obama has committed a financial crime. If a hedge fund operator did this, he'd be in jail. If a hedge fund operator ran his books the way Obama's running this country, that hedge fund, you know, you watch a show like Billions. U.S. attorney's going after this hedge fund operator. He wants to destroy him because he's jealous. 
He says, evil man, this U.S. attorney. That's the beauty of the show. It shows you that the government agent is worse than the hedge fund operator or in the same category. Let's put it to you that way. 855-407-0282 is the Savage Nation. Now we got Nevada tomorrow night. Then Wednesday we got to talk about Nevada. Why, why do we have to talk about it? They got the clock running it on CNN? Like 14 hours left. What are they, crazy? Anderson Cooper went out and got his new his teeth whitened for the event. Uh, so tomorrow in Nevada, what do you think is going to happen? She wins and he wins. Now let's move on. What do we do then? Oh, Sanders goes where? Where does he go after this? Where does Sanders go now that he served the useful purpose of making Hillary look centrist? What's his next incarnation? I hear they need a deli man at Katz's. I hear the old guy got sick. So you want Bush with the sandwich? Don't tell me what to do. I know how to cut. No, he has a big career ahead of him now, Sanders. You know what kind of lecture circuit he could do? To all the aging hippie communists out there who are living on like social security, disability, voting in three different states under three different names, living on their dead husband's uh, social security, even though they're not allowed. I'm saying this is their hope. And then at the end, it, it winds down. He does two, three years, very big numbers on the circuit. Then eventually he's reduced to the Catskill Mountains, which don't exist anymore. So he goes to the like Century Village circuit in, in Florida. The people who are comatose, but they know that the, he's like them, so they like him. No, an old guy died across the street from me. Though, their daughter came up. I don't know. I saw this guy in my neighborhood. He died. It's like people die, you know. Old man walks around. He was like shuffling for years. Then she said, did you know my father? I didn't know him. I just would wave to him for 10 years. No, I didn't know him. She said, oh, nice man. Well, he died yesterday. Oh, I'm sorry to hear it. It's the way of all flesh. That's what I'm saying to you. you know, like, we're all alive. And, like, you know, take a deep breath, boys and girls. Antonin Scalia was whacked as sure as I'm standing here, and you forgot it already. We're a nation of imbeciles. An imbecile nation. Imbecile nation. No autopsy, but you're sure it was uh, natural causes. Because one moron that they found told you that. Sure. Mr. Sandman, give me a dream. Make him the cutest that I've ever seen. Back in a minute. I don't know, maybe I'll give it all up and become a dance band leader. Welcome to the Savage Nation. I enjoyed myself last night. It's still flowing through my veins. In fact, I'm probably going to take Timbali lessons again. Get a frilly shirt. Because I don't know that I could pass the litmus test anymore the way it's going in talk radio. You know. They'll be able to give me the litmus test. Constitution, Christianity, chastity, I'd flunk. If I flunk, I have to go into like dance, a dance band or something. But uh, here we are. So tomorrow's Nevada, and then what? What's after that? Where, do we get a break? A couple of months off? I can't. I hope to God we get a long break. Robert, what, what's after Nevada? Do we get a, a month off? Nothing? Nothing. There's nothing for a month? No one knows. No one I mean. When is Super Tuesday? What year? No one knows. I'm in the business of talk radio. I don't know when Super Schmooze Day. To me, Super Schmooze Day is more interesting than Super Tuesday. At least I get to talk to people. Super Tuesday. I get, a, I think, a couple of weeks off after after next after Nevada. And uh, thank God. I don't have to do this every day. Day and night, cruise up, cruise down. He's up, he's down, he's this. And Carson, Carson can get off the stage already. Nice guy enough already with the mumbling. Bush, thank God, is gone. All right, God bless him. But I'll go back to investment banking. He can open a hedge fund. The Bush hedge fund. We move left, we move right. Then we move left again, we move right, we sell short, we sell long, and we take a commission. That's perfect for him, a hedge fund. That's why he was in the business. You know, He was an investment banker, I understand, whatever that means today, investment banker. I don't, what does an investment banker mean? People come to them with money? Who's money? Why would they come to him with money? What would he know about where to put money? How, how could he know where to put money? I'd go to Donald Trump with money if I had it and ask him what to do with it. I wouldn't go to... You know, that's an interesting question. Which of the candidates would you go to? Let's say you had money, your life savings, and you decided to invest it. All of them are investment bankers or hedge fund operators. Which one of them would you give the money to? Let's start from the top. Bernie Sanders? Yeah, right. He would steal it immediately and say, you, don't, you didn't earn it. It's not yours. Would you give it to Hillary Clinton? She'd say, what difference does it make anyways? The money disappears into the Clinton Foundation. 
Then the Republicans are. Let's go down to Republicans. Okay, we got Carson. No, no, thank you. I don't think you know where to put the money. Who else is left? I don't even know who was on the stage. Who's that guy? Kasich? I think he's worth $12. He has one suit from 1973. It's like a Dodge Dart, that guy. It was enough for me last week when he said, I'm on the side of the Pope, not Trump. Finish. Goodbye. Wouldn't give him the money. So who's left? Who's up there? I don't even know who's left anymore. Ted Cruz? Dracula? I wouldn't give any money to. I wouldn't give Dracula the money. I just don't trust him. I, there's a sneak factor to him. Remember they said about Nixon? He had like a sneaky look. He always had sweat on his upper lip. Like cost him big time in the TV thing with the, the checker speech with the dog. It's telegenic. Cruz is not telegenic. He's got those shadowy, those shady eyes. I don't care how cool he is on the Constitution, Christianity, and chastity. He can't win, man. Vampire. That's it. End of story. Uh, oh, I'll be back in a minute. Join the Savage Nation. Call now. 855-400-SAVAGE. Savage. vacation so i gotta wait a minute stop the music this tuesday is nevada of course we know already the outcome since so super tuesday is is the next tuesday march one again i gotta sit with biting my nails then what is it over she wraps it up through corruption he wraps it up through charisma then we, we get a break till election day or there's more oh the conventions pardon me Oh, no, the balloons and, the, and the, the thing, the idiots from around the country with the straw hats and the flags. We got to put up with that for about a month in August, don't we? The conventions. Oh, my God. I hope to God Trump doesn't ask me to appear at any point. I can't be around these people. They're toxic. Ever since I saw him, even before Manchurian candidate, I can't take it. The hysteria, the madness. And the, the men are worse than the women, the hysteria. There's like a certain... Like almost like a mating madness in those auditoriums. Like, a, like in, they're in heat. They're crazy. Balloons and flags and pizza and custard. and What are they so involved with this for? I ask myself. Well, whatever. I look, to each his own. If that, gets, if that gets you, as they say, if it floats your boat, I used to say, whatever the era was for that. I think that's dead already. <laughs> whatever floats your boat. That's dead, isn't it? No one uses that in this generation. The things they say, probably so dirty, I'd be in my face with... No one says whatever floats your boat. In, in uh, Clinton's generation, it was, uh, if it feels good, why not do it in the road? That was what Clinton grew up on. At least he's true to his principles. <laughs> if it feels good, do it. I mean, at least Bill's true to himself. That's what he grew up on. If it feels good, do it. Why not do it in the road? At least he's true to his principles. That's all. So I, that's the chastity part. We, have to, we don't hear about that anymore. Right? I mean, that was a big issue in the last election. The sexual thing. No, no, not a mention, not a whiff. You can't ask a thing. Who does this, what, who, what, mm, doesn't matter. The new mantra is, doesn't matter, I don't care. They do care. It's like, say, a guy is, he's saying, no, I don't care what he does. As long as he doesn't bother me, it's fine. That's not what they mean. That's the mantra, though. That's fine. Whatever he does is fine. They don't mean that. People still have feelings about those areas. There's no question about it. But it's not come up in this election is the point. There's no uh, no sexual litmus test at all anywhere along the line on this one. It's all this Christianity, chastity, and the Constitution, and whether you, you, you pass the litmus test on those. And they're important, I guess. But to me, crushing ISIS and balancing the budget seems to be important, too. Like, what's your order of priority? Build a wall. <laughs> they keep saying the same thing, Donald Trump. What's your priority? We'll build that wall right after we won. We'll build that wall. It'll be a high wall, and they'll pay for it. And all, all the doubting Thomas, no, they're not going to pay for it. Yes, they will. You can make them pay for it real easy. Believe me, you can make Mexico pay for it real easily. But, you know, I mean, will the wall get built? Sure, it's not hard to build a wall. Israel did it. Worked for them. What have you last seen the suicide bombing in Israel? Never. Remember the same liberals? How dare the Israelis build a wall to keep out those innocent Palestinians who only want to blow their children up in a pizzeria? What is wrong with those evil Nazi-like Israelis who want to live? How dare they? A good Jew is a dead Jew. That's the liberal mantra. The only good Jew is a dead Jew. Then, then they love you, wrapped up in a prayer shawl. 
being dropped in, in a hole in a pine box. So the Israelis had enough of the Palestinians bombing their children in a pizzeria. So they put, put up a wall. Do you remember the screaming about the wall? Don't build a wall. It's a throwback. Don't build a wall. It's like, a, like Germany. No, 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 no. Tear down that wall. No, they built a wall. No bombing. So once we have a wall, a lot of things happen in America. Drug dealing diminishes. The inflow of drugs dries up. It squeezes off supply. Illegal aliens, they'll go somewhere else. I don't know, maybe they'll want to go to Honduras or... You think the Mexicans will never want to uh, emigrate to, to Guatemala? I don't think so. You think they'll want to emigrate to Honduras? I don't think so. You think they're going to want to go to Panama through the Isthmus? I don't think so. You think they're going to emigrate to South America? I don't think so. There's only one place where there's the Horn of Plenty. That's up here. So, my friends, this is the Savage Nation, in case you don't know what we're listening to. Jeb Bush is finished. $130 million down the toilet. But plenty of people made money. Come on. They probably still have plenty of it. The consultant who ran the whole big pack, I was told this two years ago, took a $14 million payday off the money he raked in. It's a percentage. It's like an agent. If you raise $100 million from a super PAC, you take whatever percent you can negotiate. Apparently, he did 14%. They spent $94,000 on clubs, Bush did. Where'd they go? Dinner and event tabs at the Yale Club, the Union League Club of Chicago, Nantucket's Westmore Club. Clubs I never even heard of, let alone that wouldn't let me in. I never heard of them. That's how exclusive they are. They are so country club, they are so check pants Republican, right-wing fascist Nazi types, sneering Nazi types, that I never even heard of them. I never heard of the uh, Yale Club. Today, I guarantee the Yale Club, you can imagine what's in the Yale Club. Obama went to Yale, just shows you what the Yale Club is worth. Uh, Hillary went to the Yale, imagine what that club is worth. I would imagine, well, I, I, it's a family show, sorry. Uh, the Union League Club of Chicago, it's like old, you know, mainline. Sounds like half of them do mainline in the Union League. <laughs> sorry. Mainline. You think about just the junkies in the street? Nantucket's Westmore Club. That's a place that wouldn't even let me through the gates, the Nantucket's Westmore Club. And two other haunts of the well-heeled and ra racquetball inclined. I don't play racquetball. What do you mean well-heeled? Everyone has good heels today. Shoes are cheap. You go to Zapatos, you can have new shoes for very little money. So the Bush campaign spent $15,800 on, on uh, valets. That's okay. They spent uh, advertising, $84 million, as you'd expect. That went through friends in the advertising business. They spent uh, Vegas, $48,000 at certain hotels. The Bellagio, the Wynn, and the Venetian owned by Sheldon Adelson. <laughs> the Republican mecca donor. I wonder why they picked his hotel. Consultants, $10 million. Right, consultants, idiots. Same consultants who destroyed Romney are now advising people. I'm, I'm warning them. The day Trump hires these morons, the day his campaign goes off the rails, it's coming any day now. I can guarantee, they all hate me. I'm the original Borders Language culture guy, see, so they can't love me. Pizza, $4,800. Always pizza, Domino's from Pizza Ranch in Iowa. That's cheap, $4,800 for pizza. They all look like doughboys, they look like him. But it can't be fun around the Bush Ranch now. He's going to get spanked verbally for because the family's finished in the political world. You know, father, CIA, president, son won, president twice, I think. Was he president twice? I don't even remember anymore. The good old days? Yeah, twice. We had him for how long? We had Bush Jr. for two, eight years, right, eight years, right. Thank God of the FDR thing. He'd still be president probably. Reagan would still be president if we didn't have term, term limits. With the bullet and he would have lived another 20 years. Nancy would be running the country. It wouldn't be so bad. Nice lady. I ran into her once in Beverly Hills outside a store. Oh, you're Michael Savage. You listen to these show. Secret Service guys looked at me like leery, leery eye. They liked me, but they were afraid to say they liked me because she may not like me as much as she pretended to like me. I don't know why. You can't tell what people mean. But here we are. It's Monday. You're not that interested in any of this stuff. What's this news? Mayor wants safe space for heroin users. We're in Congress. Ithaca Mayor wants to let heroin users shoot up under nurse supervision. The nurse is probably high. Shoot up under the care of a nurse, you hear? Ithaca Mayor Zvante Merrick said that the junkie facility, which also connect addicts to recovery, 
Yeah, recovery is one piece of a new approach he wants the city to take against the scourge of addiction. There's a real cure for addiction. You want to hear the cure? Build a wall, stop the flow of drugs, and make drug dealing a, de a death sentence with one appeal. That'll dry up the supply. I'm sick and tired of hearing about treatment. If it really worked, they wouldn't go in and out of treatment. They go, they spend. It's a sad thing. Look, no one's laughing at addicts. You can get addicted from a, a, a an injury. You could have a, like a spinal thing and need a, you know, oxy. I told you the answer. Stop making Oxycontin to start with. They should arrest the owners of the company that make that stuff. It's the most toxic drug ever invented. Do I have to tell you the story again? Because I know a little bit from pharmacology, my years in pharmacology. There was such a severe addiction to morphine at the turn of the last century. People were knocking it down in every form imaginable. Tinctures, morphine. They relaxed people. 1880, 90, 1905. They were giving it to babies in a tincture. Baby cried, give it morphine. Baby was hurting from teething. <laughs> they rubbed morphine on the, t on, the, on, the, on, the, on the gum. Quieted the baby down. Turned her into a junkie, but okay, it worked. That way mommy can get some rest. Just give the baby some morphine, she'll be fine. They didn't call it morphine then. They called it, uh, they had names for it. Tincture this, tincture that. Little baby stop crying formula. Shut the kid up formula. But they used it on, on infants. They didn't know it was bad. It worked. See, those days, they didn't have like a moral thing around. It's like, oh, that stuff works. The baby stopped crying. Hey, that stuff works. All of my itises went away. My feet don't hurt. My hands don't hurt. I feel better. Let's use that stuff. It's great. Woo. Terrific stuff, that morphine. So everyone was, there was so much addiction for morphine that it became a public outcry, like stop the morphine addiction. So they went to the geniuses in the uh, chemistry area, and they said, well, can you invent something that, We'll get them off morphine. Yeah, don't worry about it. We'll come up with it. Into the lab they go. Test tubes, Frankenstein, lab equipment. Here it is, the magical formula. You see, we took morphine, and we added two acetyl groups to the morphine molecule. We have 3,6-diacetyl morphine. I don't know what it is, but it works, right? Yeah, it's called heroin. That's how, that's how heroin was, was made. So then, you know the story of heroin. So now heroin's so addictive... That they come up with the next one, methadone, worse than heroin. Now they come across, now they invent OxyContin, worse than methadone and heroin put together, addicting an entire generation. So who's responsible for it? Uh, hello, cash register, bottom line. Who makes it? Look up the company that makes it. If you had a government of the people, by the people, and for the people, don't you think that they would have stopped the manufacture of Oxy and made the manufacture of it illicitly punishable by the death penalty? End the story, no appeals. One appeal and you're going to jail for life or you're going to be executed if you make that stuff. It's killing our children. So the government, though, okay, they're looking the other way. They get a payoff and a campaign donation. They get a vacation at a resort in Texas 300 miles from the border where there's no phones, and no coroners, you know. And if they don't play ball, they uh, have a, a heart attack in the bed as a result of a pillow that fell down. We don't know where the pillow, like a fairy pillow. It was under his head. It was over his head first. It was on his face. I didn't mean it was on his head. It was on the headboard. I didn't mean his head. Oh, I see, sir. Can you explain that again to the American people? They're a little concerned that you reported that Justice Scalia was found with a pillow over his face. Okay, no, he was found with a pillow on the headboard, not on his head. Oh, 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 headboard, not head. See that? See, idiots? See, morons? You jumped at the conspiracy theory because you listened to those shows. It was on the headboard, not on his head. <laughs> Anderson, what do you have to say? I have to say this. Mr. Bush, what's your favorite music? <laughs> and on we go. Oh, then it's ski week. On to the ski vacation last week. There's like ghost town in the suburbs in, the, in California. You couldn't see a white person. Uh, on the, on the, you couldn't, didn't see a white person under 5,000 feet unless they had a regular job. The children were off the streets. It was unbelievable. Not a child was seen. It's like all day was skiing. Everybody was skiing for a week. I think they're back in school already. Thank God. Where are? What do they do for a whole week up there? God, it's over the ski week. They're going to learn something this year. Maybe they'll learn something by July fourth. They'll learn what a peninsula is. In the in the twelfth grade, that is. This state used to be number one in everything education wise. One of the reasons I loved living here when I was poor. I came here in seventy four. I didn't have much money. I was a grad student. Uh, I, I, 74, then I had one child and I had two later on and I felt good. I knew that they could go to college for free and I knew the University of California system was 
the best in the country. It had such high ratings, so many Nobel Prize winners. And I said, you know what? I'm going to leave it up to my kids to be what they want. They go to the Cal system, University of California, or the state system. Either, either one's fine. Both of my kids went to the Cal state system. They both did very well because they worked hard. And I figured, let them send themselves through college. You know, I paid for the, the uh, room and board and tuition. But enough to no, not it wasn't very low. Whatever it wasn't out of town school, like thirty grand to learn how to score coke in a ghetto. They didn't they didn't get that benefit, and then go on into a government job or work for a, you know, a Wall Street corporation where they met somebody from General Motors uh, uh, Finance Corporation, <laughs> sub finance corporation. But I'm saying used to be number one. Then what happened? Take a look at it now. Look at the look at the sad sack system now. Look at what Jerry Brown has allowed to happen to our once pristine educational system. Look how many days the kids are not in school. Look at the idiotic courses that they pass as college courses. Take a look at the idiots they let create departments for themselves. They're not smart enough to teach a regular department. They create a, they create a whole study about themselves. And they give each other like scholarly papers. I love how they use scholarly terms to describe their courses. A rigorous investigative approach to the expense of fungal nail polish. I'll be back in a minute. It is the Savage Nation. Now, today's theme, I have to spell it out for you, is Trump, you're in a Sandman. That's what I said two hours ago. I cannot believe two hours went by already without a, a single call. I didn't take a call because I started out tired from the allergies killing me. And within a few seconds, the adrenaline and the, the sheer joy of walking on the tightrope and doing what I do the way I do it so enervated me that it's almost uh, two hours into the show already. How is this possible? Well, whatever. So we're talking about is Trump your inner Sandman. I, I warned you that Obama was your inner Sandman. And look what happened with him. So no one's going to be your inner Sandman. You better find your own inner Sandman. That's a good book title. I just gave away another bestseller. There are the, well, other people wrote it down. They were sent off proposals already before I finished. They call an agent. Hello, how are you, John? Listen, I have an idea for a book about Sandman inside. Really? Uh, put something together, a couple of paragraphs. I'll get you $200,000 for that one. Uh -huh. I got to be careful because I give out too many things for nothing on the Savage Nation. Well, look, these hours are gone. There's another big hour. Sorry you don't get it in your market. If you don't, I can't help you. I can only do what I do. All the news, views, and reviews you've come to expect from Michael Savage. In the next hour, we will talk about was Scalia murdered and is Apple right or the FBI right? Right here on the Savage Nation. Join the Savage Nation. Call now, 855-400-SAVAGE, 855-400-7282. Savage. Warning, the Savage Nation contains adult language, adult content, psychological nudity. Listener discretion is advised. And now, America's most exciting radio talk show, The Savage Nation. Talk radio for the thinking person, home of borders, language, culture. And here he is, Michael Savage. What a beautiful song. Does anyone fall in love anymore? Can anyone fall in love in this cynical world? I don't know. I don't know anymore. What a world. I'm sure. Come on. People are born. They go through the same cycle. I have a granddaughter. She's two years old. What an innocent, beautiful person. I look at her and I wonder what kind of world she's going to live in. I say to myself, man, you better do everything you can. You better work real hard. You better work real hard to make sure that the Witch of Warwick doesn't win now that Bernie the Stooge is out of the box. Welcome to the Savage Nation. Just thinking out loud a little bit. If you just joined the show, I pity you because you missed everything that was good. The rest is uh, just... We're going to do a lot of calls in this hour, news, views, reviews. Saw an interesting article that I'm going to read about now, uh, talk with you about. China is buying up American companies fast, and it's freaking people out. Business Insider, Porsche Crow, they're buying up everything because we have a sick country run by criminals who should stop these sales, by the way. This should be against the law. 
You know, Canada does not permit foreigners to buy more than 20 acres of land, of, uh, of uh, wheat land. Do you know that? Uh, about five years ago, I looked into buying farmland in Canada. And as an American, I could only buy 20 acres. China's coming and buying 10,000 acres of our wheat, 20,000 acres of our corn, 100,000 acres of our soybeans. What kind of nation permits this when it's run by gangsters and criminals and lobbyists and lawyers who are the worst of all of them? You know what they're buying? They want to buy the Chicago Mercantile Exchange. Did you hear any of this? General Electric sold its appliance business to a Chinese company. Uh, Chem China's record-breaking deal for the Swiss Seeds and Pesticide Group, Syngenta, valued at $48 billion. You think they're stupid? They're buying our farmland. They're buying our seeds. They're buying our pesticides. In other words, they can starve us to death. Obama's for you, though. Don't worry about that man. He's watching the store. In between hole three and four, he's watching the store. See, I hope if Trump becomes president, he kicks them out of our country, doesn't let him do this. He's, oh, you bought the company? Now take a walk, and we're keeping the money, and you don't, own, you don't own it. That's all. Goodbye. Go back where you came from. Are you kidding me? They're buying up our whole infrastructure here. Most recently, a unit of the Chinese conglomerate H&A Group said it would buy the technology distributor Ingram Micro for six bill. Chicago Stock Exchange going to another Chinese company. 102 Chinese mergers and acquisitions deals amounting to $81 billion in value. That's up from 72 deals worth $11 billion in the same period last year. Why are they doing it? Because it's slow economic growth in China, cheap prices abroad, not so much due to the stock market's recent sell-off, but because the Chinese are manipulating their currency, just like Donald Trump says. They're manipulating their currency. And now they're using that to come in and buy up our entire nation. So uh, the uh, operators, oh, with the slowdown of the economy, Chinese corporates are increasingly looking to inorganic venues, avenues to supplement their growth. What kind of nonsense is that? Only a sick nation sells off its infrastructure. So now they want to buy the, the stock exchange. That's really great. Let them invest now, and they can have access to the $2 trillion U.S. equity marketplace, just what the doctor ordered. That's all. So we have a group called CIFUS, C-F-I-U-S. Any company that has anything to do with national security has to go through this group. Yeah, right. Yeah, <laughs> some group that is. I wonder if you could pay them off. You can imagine what you can get through them, CIFUS. CIFUS, CIFUS, CIFUS. Oh, sorry, I can make a joke about that. Early this week, California-based Fairchild Semiconductor refused an offer from the state-backed China Resources and Capital, the Financial Times reported. They bid $2.6 bill for the company, but Fairchild tur turned it down, citing concerns about U.S. regulators and accepted a lower bid from U.S.-based rival. Good for them. It wasn't, they didn't do it out of t patriotism, I guarantee you. It's because they knew that the deal with the U.S.-based company would go through, while the one with China would be scrutinized. Well, it should be. The deals are awesome. You, you can't talk about it because it's too big. You can't do anything about it. That's why you're not calling on it, 855-407. What can you say about that? Nothing. Not, what can you say? Nothing. If I asked you whether you like chocolate ice cream better or vanilla, the lines would light up. That you can answer. Now, it's not that there's something wrong with you. What can you say about China buying companies? Nothing. What could you say about Mark Zuckerberg worth $48 billion wearing an undershirt? Is that a sartorial statement or an, an example of stupidity? What is he doing that for? To show how powerful he is? Naturally, he came down on the side of his, his buddies at uh, Apple. They're all one and the same. I told you they need to be broken up. I told you any new president's got to break them up, bust, bust the trust. I, I'm sorry, they're too big. They're too big for the sake of the average American. Apple needs to be broken up. You name, name the number one competitor to, to Apple. Go ahead. Name the number one competitor to Facebook. Tell me what market share they have. Name the number one competitor to Google. Tell me the market share they have, the next search engine. You can't. Name the next competitor, the num number two competitor to Microsoft. You can't. Tell me what percent of the market they own. By any definition, each of these companies, in my estimation, is running a monopoly. And there used to be antitrust violations in this country. There was a vigorous Justice Department that was interested in more than racial harassment. And the Justice Department used to prevent companies from growing too big because they knew it's, it's the stifled competition. And the, the, the whole lifeblood of capitalism is competition, isn't it? These are not capitalist countries. Uh, sorry, these are not capitalist countries by definition. They are, they are entities unto themselves. They're nations unto themselves. Facebook's revenue is bigger than most nations. 
Google's revenue is bigger than most nations. Certainly Microsoft's revenue is bigger than, than most nations in Europe, let's say. Let's put it to you that way. And what taxes do they pay? They pay the fair share? They pay what you pay? No, they don't pay what you pay. They've got triple Dutch, quadruple Irish methodologies that were created for them by former IRS lawyers working for these giants, and they pay as little as they possibly can. They get around the law, in other words. They need to be broken up for the, for the sake of competition if you want true capitalism. How could you argue with that? And yet I, I know what's going to happen. I'm going to get someone like a purist calling me, no, Mike, this is the marketplace talking. It's the free market. You should let Google become as big as it wishes. It's the free market speaking. That's stupid. That's idiotic. It's the same kind of purist stupidity that you get out of a textbook. There's a reason for antitrust legislation. And you could see it with Apple. When you have a guy like Tim Cook think he's above the law. Now, I know all of the sides of this argument. There's arguments on both sides. And as I showed you last week, there was a hacker who created a way to do it for this one phone that would not give the government extraordinary powers over your phone or anyone else's phone. Because the technology that would be created for that one phone owned by the Muslim terrorists that they want to break into would be used once and then it would be destroyed. No possible way the same solution would work on any other device, according to the hacker. Create a RAM disk, signed by the company's production certificate, certificate for the specific ECID of the suspect's phone, and that would allow Apple to use existing technologies in the firmware file format to grant access to the phone, ensuring that there is no possible way the same solution would work on another device. I understand it's not foolproof, but it's pretty close to foolproof, and we'd find out who Fareed, Farouk, whatever, was talking to after he murdered all those people in San Bernardino, him and the old lady with the, with the burqa on, the burqa couple, the burqa twins. Find out who the burqa twins were talking to, man. We need to know. I want to know who they were talking to. And what worries me here is that if Apple and Microsoft and Google are lining up together, all of a sudden they're holy, ah, we're protecting the American people. No, that's not true. Because Apple has allowed the government to go into the phone 70 times in the past. So they're hiding something. There's something in that phone that they already know. If they have the key to it, see, if the government's going to Apple and say, hey, make a key for us, it means Apple has the key already. And they went into the phone. They already looked in the phone. L let's run that theory by. Put on your uh, fiction writer's hat with me. So someone at Apple already made that encryption key, broke the encryption, looked in the phone and said, oh, my God, Mark. Mark, look at who they were talking to, Mark. This is no good, Mark. Because it goes all the way up to the people we know in the government, Mark. One theory. One fictional theory. It's a complete and total, you have to forgive me, part-time fiction writer, three New, York Times best, three New York Times bestsellers in a row. You forgot the titles already, but some of you love my uh, writing. I haven't done one. I'm not going to do another one. It's all going to be different kind of stuff. A Time for War, Countdown to Mecca, and Abuse of Power. The Jack Hatfield series is gone. It's kaput. He's dead. Jack died. I didn't kill Jack off yet, but I'm not interested in him anymore. He's dead to me. But if I were writing a novel, that's what it would be. Like, Mark, we uh, open the phone. Take a guess who he was talking to. Who? Who? Excuse me, I'm in Bloomingdale's now buying an undershirt. He was talking to fill in the blank. All right, put up some story. Get Tim to put out a story that uh, it's for. We don't want anyone uh, with the back door. What else? Mark, hold on a minute. You want the red or the crimson? I'll take two reds and three crimson. Thank you. Uh, to have Timmy put out with the PR department a story that we don't want the FBI getting in because you want to protect the privacy, blah, blah, blah. You get it. Okay. That, yeah, that's a pink one, too. Get the pink one for those wild nights. Uh, yeah, that's the story. Get the PR department to put that out. That we're doing it for this security, this privacy of the American people. That's right. No, two pink, not one. Yeah, get throw in two. Two pink. Yeah, that's it. That's the one we'll do. That's the fiction story can't follow it. I don't think the audience is into me. I don't get it. I think they want to hear the three C's. They want to hear the litmus test every day. Chastity, Christianity, the Constitution. Stick to the facts, Mike. Don't be too creative. We're not interested in it. You're going off the rails again. Too much music, too much of that Latin stuff. We don't like Spanish. We want that wall. We never want to hear the language again. No Spanish on your show, please. English only. Don't play any of that Spanish jive music for us. We're strict constitutionalists. That's it. We're very, very rigid, strict constitutionalists. We, we don't hear any of that Spanish stuff on your show. No drum playing, no music. Settle down there, Mike. Stick to what you know. Just be a good conservative boy now. Get in line. 
get in line, be one of those old good old conservative boys. Just preach the Blarney every day. Preach the old Blarney. Step right up. Get Step right up to the conservative Blarney show. Constitutions, Christianity, and chastity. Step right up. You know what? I decided I'm going to be me. If I'm in one of my moods like I am today, I'm going to be me. I'm going to play music. I'm going to play the drums on air, which I did. I'm going to sing on air, which I did. You missed it all. I'm going to tell you about a dance I went to last night. I'm going to play sweet music that's dead. I'm, what do you want me to do? Every day the same thing? Three hours a day, you can go brain dead from it. Or if you're born with no brains, you could do it three hours a day for 30 years. It doesn't matter. The same thing, Democrat, Republican, Democrat, Republican. Why them Democrats? I tell you, they're no good. Now, for years it was, why them Republicans are the only lifesaver for America? Why the only hope for America is them Bushes? I guarantee you, I went to the White House. I went golfing with them. They're the most wonderful people on earth. Speed forward. No, you don't trust them Republicans. No way do you trust them. Why I throw that banner in the river? You can listen to this now. More, more baloney. So that's why I'd rather not do that. You mind? Okay, that opens it up to a call. After two hours and fifteen minutes, I have not. This is a world record, uh, Robert. I have. It's a world record today. I have not taken a single phone call in two hours and fifteen minutes of radio, and I started out exhausted from the allergies. I'm flying right now on on adrenaline and calamari and french fries and uh, gherkins. I'll be back in a minute. I am live after this connect. I think we lost the connection. Play a little Latin music, so I know if I'm, Am I communicating with my audience? A little quirk, a little FBI quirker. Yeah. Aquí está Sombrero Mike. Arriba. $1.9 billion requested by the fool on a hill to combat the spread of the Zika virus in Latin America. You believe this? This guy has no limits to his hubris and his madness. He knows that he's out of control, and he knows finally the country has taken a turn against him by the popularity of Sanders and the popularity of Trump. That clown in the White House had the nerve to say he's not just a big government crazy liberal because he knows that everyone knows that's what he is. But worse, listen to this clip 19 on the Savage Nation. Listen carefully to the clown on the hill. We have been very stringent and very tight, and our numbers all check out when it comes yeah, right. to the costs and the benefits uh, that we yeah. apply to these yeah, tests. Right. Sure, Even right. on some of the big regulations you hear about mm -hmm. that you don't like, right? they're not, pa they're not issued unless... Mm -hmm. We th the benefits substantially too hot. Uh, outweigh the costs, um, right. and we can we have the numbers to prove it. So, uh, for those of you who think that uh, I'm just a big government crazy liberal, <laughs> you know, we're we're actually we we crunch some numbers around here. Uh, oh, we take yeah, it very seriously. Can. All right, so so the clown on the hill wants us to believe because he honked his horn that he doesn't spend any money. Even though the, it's thirteen trillion dollar debt, he inherited like one trillion. Now it's thirteen trillion, printing money to keep the fools in line. He says we don't spend the money unless the benefits outweigh the costs. Uh, Mr. Obama, seventy-two personal assistants for the first lady. Do the benefits outweigh the costs to the American people? No, but the benefits outweigh the costs to her, your wife. Okay, so I see that. You mean the benefits to you and your family? I get it. The use of Air Force One, the abuse of Air Force One, the abuse of Air Force Two, the endless vacations, the golf trips. I see the benefits to you outweigh the cost to the American people. Oh, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Take it back. You meant the benefits to you and your family, not to the American people. Got it. Now I understand. So now he wants $1.9 billion to combat the spread of the Zika virus in Latin America. What do you think that money's going to go for? If you read Diseases Without Borders, my bestseller that only came out a week ago, went right to the top of the list, the ebook. What am I saying? What you do is you stop the travel from the countries where Zika is now endemic, where it's out of control, where it's growing. Just slam it shut already. Stop with the idiocy. That's the first rule of epidemiology. Cut it off. You don't let sick people come into the country to spread a disease unless you yourself are sick or hate the country. But, okay, no, he needs money now. The liberal answer to everything. Just throw money at the problem. Don't close the border to these countries. Just throw money at the problem. Then let it go from $13 billion to $15 billion overnight. Ka-ching, Mr. Obama. Join the Savage Nation. Call now, 855-400-SAVAGE. Savage.
It is the Savage Nation. I think I get a cowbell for my Mercedes. I wonder if it's an option I can get. A cowbell is in the center console that I can tap on with a, with a drumstick. I need a little rhythm back in my life. You know, this is very two-dimensional radio. I've got to tell you the truth. I mean, it's a wonderful, wonderful expression up to a point, but it's two-dimensional. You can't see my paintings. You can't, well, you know, if it's not verbal, how do you know what I'm doing? I want you to think about that. You know, you watch a movie. Look at all the dimensions that can be put together in a movie. And then you look at what always impresses me is everyone thinks that they can do talk radio, which they can't. And there's not a person out there who doesn't think that they couldn't direct or produce a movie, which they can't. You look at the end of a movie, you see like 300 names. All the things that the people do to make that thing happen, whether it's a good TV show, all of the, high, the highly skilled individuals who make a television show work, you know, and you think about, it, oh, yeah, I can do that. Yeah, just give me that camera and I'll be a director. No, you can't be a director. You can't be a talk show host. It's the same thing. Either you're good at something or you're not. And if you've listened to the show, you know that sometimes I get frustrated by the dimensions of the show, meaning there are limitations to it. I can only do certain things in radio. It's all about voice. But there's no other expression permitted. And I want to express myself in other ways. Is what I'm, I can almost feel myself breaking out of my own limitations right in, right in front of the audience. I don't know where it's going to lead. I don't know. I'm a guy who just is always inventing stuff and creating stuff. So I read you a poem today. I played a drum on the air. I sang on the air. I ate a sandwich on the air. <laughs> you weren't supposed to hear the sandwich, <laughs> but I can't help it. I'm a human being, three hours a day, and then this time of day I'm not supposed to eat. So thus far, we've talked about who is your inner Sandman. And I said, Rubio is Edelman's, Cruz looks like a vampire, Cruz thinks Duck Dynasty would be a good ambassador. That tells you everything you need to know about him. Then I said, all politicians will disappoint you. Nobody can give you 100%. Stop being a purist. Purists don't win in the real world. Blood in the water. Pope calls for worldwide ban on death penalty. When was he ever a pope? Israel snubs Sanders' outreach because they know that he's not their Sandman. He's a, he's a socialist, and they reject socialism because they know it creates racism. That's what the Israelis say. But I said, at least Sanders offers some change, and that's why Obama's changing his tune about it. I'm not just a big government crazy liberal. And then I said, Trump is a verbal cage fighter. He's blowing everyone around him in the cage, which is why we like him. America likes a winner. And we want to see him vanquish our enemies. We want to see our enemies bleeding in the cage and dragged off on a stretcher. There he is. End the story. All of the foreign nations that are bad-mouthing us, the Chinese ripping us off, the Mexican government ripping us off. We'd like to see them taken out of the cage is what we want to see. And he's saying he can do it. And then I, I, mean, I said something, I think, and I still I agree with it to this minute. I said the Republican campaign to date seems to have been Cruz baiting everyone with the holier-than-thou campaign, that he's more conservative than this one, more conservative than that one. You know, Jacques Cuse is like communism. I accuse you, Mr. Trump, of not being a pure enough conservative. I ask you to stand before the American people and prove definitively that you are, in fact, and you will take that conservative loyalty oath right now in front of me, Ted Cruz. And here is the U.S. Constitution. I want you to swear the Bible and the Constitution that you love the Constitution with all your heart, more than you love Melania, and that you are truly a Christian, and you are a chaste man just like me, Ted Cruz. Vote for me because I am the three C's. That's what we're hearing now. And I object to it. I'm sick of it. That's what I'm trying to tell you is going on. So that's what you missed so far. The phone number here is 855-497-282. I haven't taken a call yet, 2 hours and 35 minutes into the show. This is actually a world record for me. You know, people use call. You don't understand about talk radio, what it is. It's a little secret. Should I tell everyone? I've got to be very careful here. No, don't tell them why. No, don't tell them what callers really are to the... Eh, what do I care? You know, it's too far into my career to care. Why hold anything back? A caller is a record. We're like disc jockeys. I know most won't tell you that. Every talk show thinks he could be president, but uh, it's like everyone thinks they can produce a movie or they can do talk radio. But, you know, they're not the president. We're talkers, so you have to have an entertainment factor, an education factor, and then something else, right? Callers are to talk radio what records are to a disc jockey. And sometimes the records are good and sometimes they're bad, and people criticize me and say, oh, you cut callers off. Well, the guy's hemming and hawing, and he shouldn't have gotten on to begin with. 
when you're Mike, I'm here, yeah, I'm in the Bronx, I'm in the Bronx, this morning, last guy, my uncle had a pickle, just like your uncle had a pickle, bingo, he shouldn't have gotten on, what do you want to do, talk to him, I hang up on him, I'm not being rude, I don't want to hear any more of that, you don't know me, I'm not your friend, we're not friends, I see, that's the problem, I'm too familiar, people listen to the show, they think it's like a party line, they think they're talking to a friend, I, okay, I want to be your friend up to a point, but I'm not, I'm not your friend. And the thing is, it gets too familiar for the average listener to listen to it. So I hang up if it's boring to me because I know it's boring to you. And the audience is very uh, fickle. The audience is to radio is fickle like everything. It's click, 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 turn, turn, turn. Like on television. Look, you sit with a clicker in front of a TV, right? Click, click, click. What do you think they're doing in radio? Click, 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 click. They're clicking. So clicked. Everyone's clicking. Used to cluck, now they're clicking. If it clicks like a duck, it's a clicker, whatever. The point is, is that I got to keep the show moving. So the most important thing is that I enjoy it. The day I start not enjoying my show is I'm out of business. You can tell when someone's calling it into their board. The minute you hear the same thing over and over again all day long, you know already what you're getting. So if I have to entertain myself, I will. I'm like a monkey in a cage sometimes. I have to play drums. I have to eat on the air. Whatever I have to do to keep my energy and spirits up. Oh, the stick just fell on the floor. That actually happened now. The stick from the timbales fell on the floor. I keep a set of timbales here in the studio. Sometimes I play during breaks to keep myself up. So here's the news. Oh, and a poem I gave you today, all for, all for the price of nothing. You paid nothing for the show. Everyone's a star behind their car. Did you hear that brilliant poem? No one, not, not a word. That's why I didn't take a call. They only want to talk about topics like that they could read on the Internet. I read you a poem. I wrote it for my guts. No one heard it. No one cares what I do. This is the problem. I could speak in eight languages on the. I could speak in Latin. I could read the Bible in Latin and no one would care. I get a call, Mike. I want to say to this about Ted Cruz. You know, the fact is he's the only one who really knows the country. That's what I'm going to get any. So that's why I'm not taking callers. Because I don't want to go back to the, to the single dimension radio show. I could read the Holy Catechism in, in Latin. Nobody would call. I write a poem for my heart, the most brilliant poem you heard all day. Everyone's a star behind their car. Everyone's a star behind the car. Everyone's a star from afar because everyone's marred. Everyone's slightly marred. The brigadier, the buccaneer, debonair or doctrinaire, the gondolier or the pamphleteer. Everyone's a star from afar. And I was trying to make a point with it. Zero, no call. Because it's too, it's too esoteric. Maybe that's my problem is I'm too esoteric for this medium. I think that radio has changed. I think the audience in America has changed as a result of a number of factors. A lot of people have tuned out. Now they're tuning in. And all they want to hear is, you know, what are the results in, in, in uh, Poughkeepsie? What do they need a radio show to tell them what the results are in Poughkeepsie? You can get it on the Drudge Report in two seconds. So you've got to get something different from me than what you can get off the Internet. Isn't that the object of radio? And the day we become, see, there used to be a time that radio was unique and it was different from the Internet. Now, if all we're doing is, is repeating what you can read on the Drudge Report, what are you listening to us for? Therefore, enter Michael Savage. I've got to do what I do, and I've got to broaden my, uh, my show the way I used to do. I want to go back to what I used to do. I'm so tired of politics, I could start smashing things into the, into the, into the monitor. I'm tired of it. And if I'm bored of it, you're, how many times can you hear already the same thing over and over again? Trump won. Oh, you didn't know that Saturday night? You already saw you turned it on for two seconds, bleary-eyed. There he was. There's Melanie again. How, how are you? Jackie Kennedy, how you doing? The children, the daughters, I love them. Have it, let's get the election over with already. Let them go into the White House, see what the furniture was, what furniture was stolen. See what they can find on the way out. Did they, why do the Democrats always steal furniture? Did they ever find what Hillary Clinton took? Remember that big story when they left? I think took ashtrays and stuff. I don't know what they... What was that big scandal? Forget about it, but they cleaned it out. They took all the good stuff. They took the China. <laughs> they sold it on eBay. What if you pick it up one day? It's genuine White House, <laughs> White House porcelain, <laughs> White House tablecloth with a monogram from the White House, from the East Room, the West Room, the North Room, the South Room. We got sheets from the Truman Room. We got pillowcases from the FDR Room. All the linen from the other room was burned after this administration because no one knows it was in there. <laughs> We got the room where Al Sharpton slept. They had to fumigate the room. They had to burn the room to the ground. They took it down to the studs after he slept there. Trump comes in. He's got to take the White House down to the studs. Sorry. I'm sorry. That was very funny. 
No, I, I just am like, I'm into house renovation, like a little thing. And I, it's like a house, some house you have to take down to the studs. That's, you don't know what's coming next time. So here I am. Is anyone enjoying this show? Robert, I don't know. See, it's, no, it's the problem with not a live audience. If I was in a live audience and I'm looking at you and I say smiling, people, yeah, go on, Mike, right, right, right on, just see their faces. But in radio, I'm staring at two guys in Dallas, a board operator named Robert Borowski, nice young man. And I see the back of uh, his head, Jim's head, Jim Verde's head. The, the, the back of his head, he's looking at stock quotations on his screen. He thinks I don't know that he's not working on the show. But don't look, I see graphs he's looking at. He must have a big investment portfolio. Instead of looking for stories and sound, he's always like, how is investment? I'm joking, come on. It's good nature. I only see two people. Dog's not with me, it's Monday. Monday is hair day. Twice a week he goes to Irene the groomer. Monday, Friday. You know what kind of money I spend on hair for that dog? So, oh, he's nice, man. It must cost you a lot to take care of that poodle. He looks like a little bear. I said, yeah, he goes to the groomer twice a week. Women get jealous. Twice a week, yeah, more than I go. I go like twice a year to a barber. That's if I even go twice. I don't even go twice a year. And I'm getting like unkempt. I'm something like I don't care anymore. No, I do shave. That's the first sign. That's bad. Older guys who don't shave, that's it. That's like the loss of, of like self-respect. Watch out for your old man if he's in the house. He starts wearing like sweatpants and doesn't shave. That's intervention. Don't don't let him say to you he's just he just wants to be natural now after all he is a working for a company. Don't let him get away with this. The next this next stop is like a senility. The next thing you know is he'll wear he'll put his pajamas on over his sweatsuit and then he'll put a tuxedo on over his pajamas when you have to go to a wedding. You got to get him under control. Guys go out faster than the women the mind the mind because if they work they don't know what to do with themselves after they retire. What's the point of this retirement business? If I ever retired from anything, I'd be dead within six months. There's nothing out there. It's like a blank. There's like a blank world. I spent all day yesterday trying to enjoy myself, and I actually did. I loved it, doing nothing. I actually found that I could do nothing. That's the funny part. I found out that the naturalist in me still lives. I took I took the old camper. I have a 2006 Chevy camper van. Looks like new, like showroom. It's only got 20,000 miles on it. I bought it new. I rarely go. You know, use. Took it out. Loaded it up with a picnic like a penguin cooler, whatever it's called, a little coolers. I haven't done that in years. You know, you get a certain point of affluence, you don't do that anymore. You're not allowed to do that. It's like for the poor people. I filled up a picnic cooler for Teddy and I, and I went down to a certain area I like. I won't tell you where. And I listened to the water coming in, and I walked around by the water, and I picnic just for an hour or two. You know what? It was beautiful. It was, suddenly it was 1968 again. And I realized I could turn the clock back if I really wanted to. I could turn the clock back, and that's what I'm trying to say to you. Then at night, I went to that Latin club for a couple of hours, and I heard the, the great Latin music. The band was astounding. You know, you say, oh, nothing's as good as it was. This was so good. This is a local group of Latino guys. Well, there were some white guys in the back. One of them was a flautist and a trombone player. I never heard anything like this since the old days. The timbales player was as good as uh, El Rey de Timbal. I'm telling you, like, it was so good watching everyone dance and enjoy themselves. It was, and then ethnically, I, I told you this before, it's an important point. As an older white guy, it's nice to go into a club that's mainly Latino and black guys and, and get along with everybody. What's the big deal? You see, because we live behind closed doors, the closed doors of our mind. And we start building up these barriers, you know, like, oh, I go in there, it's not going to work. Everyone's going to hate me because I'm white. No one hated anyone. If they did, I wouldn't have known it. And it's a crowded floor. You know, you brush against someone, excuse me, both ways. Everyone's polite. Nobody wants a problem when they're out to have a good time. And what I'm saying to you is it, it opens up your mind again to the world the way it really is, as opposed to the way the newspapers make it. Now, of course, there's areas you can't go into. I get that. Like all of San Francisco in certain areas. The cops don't even go there. I'll be back in a minute. Greatest group in history. So I, this is a world breaker. I mean, if you listen to this show from from the beginning to now, it's the first show in 21 years where I've not taken a single call. Not one. Not one call. I don't know why. I don't know how it happened. The only call I was looking forward to I didn't get, it would have sounded something like this. Mike, I'm uh, with the FBI. Uh, I can't. Uh, I'm behind the voice modulator. And listen, drop that thing with Apple, will you please? Because the fact is they've already gone in the phone and the calls were made right to DHS. But... Uh, head of DHS was out with a migraine. 
Just let that go, would you, Mike? If you know what's good for you. Bye now. Mm. We didn't get that call. But uh, here we are in the Savage Nation on the iPhones, the uh, B phones, the C phones. I read a report today that uh, people are buying what I have, a flip phone now. They're so tired of the uh, iPhones connected to the Internet, they want to be unconnected. I got a phone. I have an iPhone. I rarely use it. And then I have the old phone, the kind that the guys on Mulberry Street <laughs> use in New York. <laughs> I have an Italian friend. He laughed. He came in from New York. He said, you still have one of those old phones, a flip phone? He says, yeah. He says, my friends will have five of them. You know, we throw them away every day. <laughs> Thank you. I didn't hear that one. But I use the phone not for any uh, nefarious purposes. It's, it gets reception in, a, in an elevator. And that, it's that what do I need it for? Connect to the Internet everywhere I am. Every second, I don't look at it. And I lose it all the time in my pocket. I have to call it to find out where it is. Then I ask the dog. He gets there. I get him nervous now about the cell phone. It's so small. Teddy, where's the phone? He gets nervous. He looks up. What do I know? Eddie, you're the person. What do you want from me? I was sleeping, having a good afternoon. What do you ask me about a cell phone for? You're supposed to be a dog. You're supposed to know these things. I don't know about phones. They don't smell. It doesn't smell like the back of another dog. Leave me alone. I'm tired. Go away. It's been the Savage Nation. I hope you've enjoyed it. I hope you learned something. Come back tomorrow. Be here. Same station. Savage.